Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. Part Two, A Midsummer's Night's Dream, Chapter Seven. Twenty years after the end of air travel, the caravans of the traveling symphony moved slowly under a white hot sky. It was the end of July, and the 25 year old thermometer affixed to the back of the lead caravan read 106 Fahrenheit, 41 Celsius. They were near Lake Michigan, but they couldn't see it from here. Trees pressed in close at the sides of the road and erupted through cracks in the pavement, saplings bending under the caravans and the soft leaves brushing the legs of horses and symphony alike. The heat wave had persisted for a relentless week. Most of them were on foot to reduce the load of, on the horses, who had to be rested in the shade more frequently than anyone would have liked. The symphony didn't know this territory well and wanted to be done with it, but speed wasn't possible in this heat. They walked slowly, with weapons in hand, the actors running their lines and the musicians trying to ignore the actors, scouts watching for danger ahead and behind on the road. It's not a bad test, the director had said earlier in the day. Gil was 72 years old, riding, on, riding in the back of the second caravan now, his legs not quite what they used to be. If you can remember your lines in questionable territory, you'll be fine on stage. Enter Lear, Kirsten said. Twenty years earlier, in a life she mostly couldn't remember, she had had a small, non-speaking role in a short-lived Toronto production of King Lear. Now she walked in sandals whose soles had been cut from an automobile tire, three knives in her belt. She was carrying a paperback version of the play, the stage directions highlighted in yellow. Mad, she said, continuing, fantastically dressed with wild flowers. But who comes here? The man, learning the part of Edgar, said. His name was August, and he had only recently taken to acting. He was the second violin and a secret poet, which is to say that no one in the symphony knew he wrote poetry except Kirsten and the seventh guitar. The safer sense will near accommodate, will near accommodate. Line, his master thus, Kirsten said. Cheers. The safer sense will near accommodate his master thus. The caravans had once been pick, pickup trucks, but now they were pulled by teams of horses on wheels of steel and wood. All of the pieces rendered useless by the end of gasoline had been removed. The engine, the fuel supply system, all the other components that no one under the age of 20 had seen in operation, and a bench had, to be in, had, to been, had been installed on top of each cab for the drivers. The cabs were stripped of everything that added excess weight, but left otherwise intact, with doors that closed and windows of difficult-to-break automobile glass, because then they were traveling through fraught territory, it was nice to have somewhere relatively safe to put the children. The main structures of the caravans had been built in the pickup beds, tarps lashed over their frames. The tarps on all three caravans were painted gunmetal gray, with the traveling symphony lettered in white on both sides. No, they cannot touch me for coining, Dieter said over his shoulder. He was learning the part of Lear, although he wasn't really old enough. Dieter walked a little ahead of the other actors, murmuring his fa to his favorite horse. The horse, Bernstein, was missing half his tail because the first cello had just restrung his bow last week. Oh, August said, thou side-piercing sight. You know what side-piercing? The third trumpet muttered, listening to King Lear three times in a row in a heat wave. You know what's even more side-piercing, Alexandra? Was 15, the symphony's youngest actor? They'd found her on the road as a baby, traveling for four days between towns at the far edge of the territory. What does side piercing mean? Olivia asked. She was six years old, the daughter of the tuba and an actress named Lynn, and she was riding on the back of the second caravan with Gil and a teddy bear. We'll be in St. Deborah by the water in a couple of hours, Gil said. There's absolutely nothing to worry about. There was the flu that exploded like a neutron bomb over the surface of the earth, and the shock of collapse that followed the first unspeakable years when everyone was traveling before everyone caught on that there was no place that they could walk to where life continued as it had as it had before and settled wherever they could clustered close together for safety in truck stops and former restaurants and old motels the traveling symphony moved between the settlements of the changed world and had been doing so since 5 years after the collapse when the conductor had gathered a few of her friends from the military orchestra, left the air base where they'd been living, and set out into the unknown landscape. 
By then, most people had settled somewhere because the gasoline was all gone stale by year three and you can't keep walking forever. After six months of traveling from town to town, the word town used loosely, some of these places were four or five families living together in a former truck stop, the conductor's orchestra had run into Gill's company of Shakespearean actors who had all escaped from Chicago together and then worked on a farm for a few years and been on the road for three months and they'd combine their operations. Years after the collapse, they were still in motion, traveling back and forth along the shores of Lake Huron, Lake Huron in Michigan, west as far as Traverse City, east and north over the 49th parallel to King Cardine. They followed the St. Clair River south to the fishing towns of Marine City and Algonac and back again. This territory uh, for the most part was for the most part tranquil now. They encountered other travelers only rarely, peddlers mostly, uh, carting miscellanea between towns. The symphony performed music, classical, jazz, orchestral piece arrangements of pre-collapsed pop songs and Shakespeare. They performed more modern plays sometimes in the first few years, but what was startling, what no one could have anticipated, was the audience, well, audiences seemed to prefer Shakespeare to other theatrical offerings. People want what was best about the world, Dieter said. He himself found it difficult to live in the present. He'd played in a punk band in college and longed for the sound of an electric guitar. There were no more than two hours out of St. Deborah by the Water now. The Lear rehearsal had dissipated midway through the fourth act, everyone tired, tempers fraying in the heat. They stopped to rest the horses, and Kirsten, who didn't feel like resting, walked a few paces down the road to throw knives at a tree. She threw from five paces, from ten, from twenty, the satisfying sound of the blades hitting wood, hitting wood. When the symphony began to move again, she climbed up into the back of the second caravan where Alexandra was resting and mending a costume. Okay, Alexandra said, picking up an earlier conversation. So when you saw the computer screen in Traverse City, what about it? In Traverse City, the town they'd recently left, an inventor had rigged an electrical system in an attic. It was, a modest, it was modest in scope, a stationary bicycle that, when pedaled vigorously, could power a laptop, but the inventor had grander aspirations. The point wasn't actually the electrical system. The point was that he was looking for the Internet. A few of the younger symphony members had felt a little thrill when he'd said this, remembering the stories they'd been told about Wi-Fi and the impossible-to-imagine cloud, wondered if the internet might still be out there somehow, invisible pinpricks of light suspended in the air around them. Was it the way you remembered? I don't really remember what computer screens look like, Kirsten admitted. The second caravan had particularly bad shocks, and riding it always made her feel like her bones were rattling. How could you not remember something like that? It was beautiful. I was eight. Alexander nodded, unsatisfied, and obviously thinking that if she'd seen a lit-up computer screen when she was eight, she'd have remembered it. In Traverse City, Kirsten had stared at the this webpage is not available message on the screen. She didn't seriously believe that the inventor would be able to find the internet, but she was fascinated by electricity. She harbored visions of a lamp with a pink, uh, with a pink shade on the side table, a nightlight shaped like a puffy half-moon, a chandelier in the dining room, a brilliant stage. The inventor had pedaled frantically to keep the screen from flickering out, explaining something about satellites. Alexander had been enraptured, the screen a magical thing with no memories attached. August had stared at the screen with a lost expression. When Kirsten and August broke into abandoned houses, this was a hobby of theirs, tolerated by the conductor, because they found useful things sometimes, August always gazed longingly at televisions. As a boy, he'd been quiet and a little shy, obsessed with classical music. He'd had no interest in sports and had never been especially adept at getting along with people, which meant long hours home alone after school in interchangeable U.S. Army base houses while his brothers played baseball and made new friends. One thing about television shows was that they were everywhere. Identical programming, whether your parents had posted, were posted to Maryland or California or Texas. He'd spent an enormous amount of time before the collapse watching television, playing the violin, or sometimes doing both simultaneously. And Kirsten could picture this, August at 9, at 10, at 11, pale and scrawny with dark hair falling in his eyes, and a serious, somewhat fixed expression, playing a child-sized violin in a wash of electric blue light. 
When they broke into houses now, August searched for issues of TV Guide, mostly obsolete by the time of the, the pandemic hit, but used by a few people right up to the end. He liked to flip through them later at quiet moments. He claimed he remembered all the shows, starships, sitcom living rooms with enormous sofas, police officers sprinting through the streets of New York, courtrooms with stern-faced judges presiding. He looked for books of poetry, even rarer than TV Guide copies, and studied these in the evenings or while he was walking with the symphony. When Kirsten was in the houses, she searched for celebrity gossip magazines, because once, when she was 16 years old, she flipped through a magazine on a dust-blackened side table and found her past. Happy reunion, Arthur Leander picks up son Tyler in LAX. Scruffy Arthur meets seven-year-old Tyler, who lives in Jerusalem with his mother, model actress Elizabeth Colton. The photograph, Arthur with a three-day beard, rumpled clothes, a baseball cap, carrying a small boy who beamed up at his father's face while Arthur smiled at the camera. The Georgia flu would arrive in a year. I knew him, she told August, breathless. He gave me the comics I showed you. And August had nodded and asked to see the comics again. There were countless things about the pre-collapsed world that Kirsten couldn't remember. Her street address, her mother's face, the TV shows that August never stopped talking about. But she did remember Arthur Leander, and after that first sighting, she went through every magazine she could find in search of him. She collected fragments, stored in a Ziploc bag in her backpack. A picture of Arthur alone on a beach, looking pensive and out of shape. A picture of him with his first wife, Miranda, and then later with his second wife, Elizabeth, a malnourished-looking blonde who didn't smile for cameras. Then there with their son, who was about the same age as Kirsten, and later still with a third wife who looked very similar to the second one. You're like an archaeologist, Charlie said, and when Kirsten showed off when Kirsten showed off her findings, Charlie had wanted to be an archaeologist when she was little. She was a second cello and one of Kirsten's closest friends. Nothing in Kirsten's collection suggested the Arthur Leander she remembered, but what did she actually remember? Arthur was a fleeting impression of kindness and gray hair, a man who'd once pressed two comic books into her hands. I have a present for you. She was almost certain, he'd said, and sometime after this moment, the clearest memory she retained from before the collapse, a stage, a man in a suit, talking to her while Arthur lay still on his back with paramedics leaning over him, voices and crying and people gathering, snow somehow falling even though they were indoors, electric light blazing down upon them. Chapter 8 The comics Arthur Leander gave her. Two issues from a series no one else in the symphony had ever heard of. Dr. Eleven, Volume 1, Number 1, Station Eleven, and Dr. Eleven, Volume 1, Number 2, The Pursuit. By year 20, Kirsten had them memorized. Dr. Eleven is a physicist. He lives in, on a space station, but it's a highly advanced space station that was designed to resemble a small planet. There were deep blue seas and rocky islands linked by bridges, orange and crimson skies with two moons on the horizon. The contrabassoon, who prior to the collapse was in the printing business, told Kirsten that the comics had been produced at great expense, all those bright images, that archival paper. So actually not comics at all in the traditionally mass-produced sense, possibly someone's vanity project. Who would that someone else have been? There is no biographical information in either issue, initials in place of the author's name by M.C. In the inside cover of the first issue, someone had written copy 2 of 10 in pencil. In the second issue, the notation is copy 3 of 10. Is it possible that, the, that only 10 copies of each of these books exist in the world? Kirsten's taking care of the comics as best she can, but they're dog-eared now, worn soft at the edges. The first issue falls open to a two-page spread. Dr. Eleven stands on dark rocks overlooking an indigo sea at twilight. Small boats move between islands, wind turbines spinning on the horizon. He holds his fedora in his hand. A small white animal stands by his side. Several of the older symphony members have confirmed that this animal is a dog, but it isn't like any dog Kirsten's ever seen. Its name is Luli. It looks like a cross between a fox and a cloud. A line of text across the bottom of the frame. I stood looking over my damaged home and tried to forget the sweetness of life on earth.